Okay. <clears throat> Hello, everybody, and welcome. Good evening to Shadow Paths Industry Slam Session. Uh, this is Shadow Paths event, and I am the artistic director of Shadow Path. My name is Alex, and I am also your host for this evening. Before we jump in, I wanted to just pass it over to Misa to say a few words. Hi, um, we have all come together to celebrate and acknowledge the work and lives of female playwrights through the ages. Many of these women and their works have been forgotten or ignored as time marched over, forward over their stories. Before we move on to them, we'd like to acknowledge the earliest storytellers that lived on the lands we now occupy. These lands are the traditional lands and territories of the Mississaugas, the New Credit First Nation, the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe peoples. Regardless of who occupies the land now, the histories of those that previously cared for it, the stories they told, and the lives they lived are still an integral part of it. In sharing the lives and stories of other forgotten people, we hope to create a bridge between all people and work toward a better, more inclusive future where each of us is heard and our contributions acknowledged and remembered. Thank you, Misa. We are fortunate enough to also have a Shadow Path board member with us tonight. Georgia is one of our panelists, and I will pass it over to her to say, um, to share a message from the organization. As soon as she unmutes herself. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. <laughs> All right, I'm good. The Shadow Path family stands in solidarity with Black Lives Matter and commits to actions and attitudes that fully support our Black community. We aim to be part of the urgent change necessary to create a truly equal community. Thank you, Georgia. And we are doing this through actions that are specific and conscious through the programs that we are presenting, through the artists that we are collaborating with and featuring, and through the stories and perspectives that we are giving platform to. And we commit to continuing to evaluate how we can do more. So the industry sessions started at Shadow Path back in 2016 as part of our apprenticeship program. And we were meeting with leaders, female identified leaders in the performing arts industry in Toronto to learn a little bit about their story, their journey, um, how it is they are doing what it is they're doing and how they got to where they are in the industry so that we can forge connectedness with them and learn and grow from their trials and tribulations uh, as a female performing artist. So we wanted to continue this activity on a virtual platform and um, we wanted to also rename the event Industry Slam Sessions, not only because we like a good acronym at Shadow Path, but because we wanted to keep that activity of meeting with industry leaders alive and well at Shadow Path. So SLAM stands for She Leads an Arts Movement. And the women that we are meeting with are carving their own way. They are making their own path. They are decision makers and um, creating their artistic dreams. So we feel we have a lot that we can learn from them. And tonight's guest, I'm very delighted to say, is Trey Anthony. Um, she is an award-winning writer, motivational speaker, life coach, mother, just to name a few. And um, she is also the first Black woman in Canada to have a television series on a primetime network. Her works include the plays The Kink of My Hair, How Black Mothers Say I Love You, and she has a book coming out in January called Black Girl in Love with Herself. Let's give a virtual round of applause to Trey Anthony. 
Thank you for having me. Thanks, Trey. How are you this evening? I'm great, thank you. Really great. Good. Well, um, one more thing I wanted to mention before we dive in is we also have an excellent group of go-getters as our panelists this evening. We have Chantel, T, Misa, and Georgia. And they are going to introduce themselves as they ask their question to Trey. So we'll get to learn a little bit more about each of them as well. So let's jump right in and we can start with Chantal. Hi, hi, I'm Chantal Ford. Uh, I am a writer and director, an occasional producer and performer, um, also a new mother and an educator as well. Uh, so lots of things going on. Um, so Trey, uh, my, my question um, was, you had incredible success with the kink in my hair. And it started with the fringe, which is the ultimate dream for so many people that are uh, submitting to fringe and producing in fringe. Um, so I was wondering if you could share with us a little bit about the process of um, after fringe, how you moved to uh, Theatre Pass Mirai and then to Mervish and beyond, uh, what the steps looked like, how it changed, uh, how the process changed and how the show changed. Yes, so for the kink um we did the french festival as you guys mentioned and when we were at the french festival one of um the actors um ngozi paul had a relationship um a work relationship knew very well um lane coleman who was the artistic director at that time at theater pass Mirai. and by this time the fringe was like um, the show at the Fringe was like breaking box office records and there were people lining up around the block for the show. I remember one day pulling up to the theater and I was just like, who are all these people lined up for? And then I realized it was our show. So it was just kind of crazy. But Ngozi invited Lane to come and see the show. And then Lane came and saw it. And then he invited us to close. I think it was their 30th anniversary season. It was either to close or open. I can't remember, but I do know it was, they were celebrating their 30th year. And so that's how we got into Theatre Pass Mirai. And then the story of the Mervish deal, um, and this is something that I will tell all artists. I have a reputation, people have said about me that, um, what was the word they used for me? Um, I micromanage <laughs> that, um, I'm very hands-on on my work and it's something that um, I think if I was a man or a white man someone would describe it as something much more positive but after each show at um, Theatre Pass Mirai I would go to the box office and I would ask for the guest list of who came and I would study it every single night and as I was studying it one night I came across that the guest list that um, there was a a producer from Mervish who had shown up and come to the show. And so I was like, oh, this is interesting. And so what I did is I actually then called Mervish. I, I called them and people are always like, what do you mean you ca just called them? And I, I, I said, I find sometimes um, we think things are way harder than they actually are. And it's not that hard. Like you just call and you find the number and you ask for who you need to speak to. But a lot of times people will have this fear of, oh, I can't do that. And I've never been that type of person. I've always been like, you know what, I'm gonna take an initiative. And so I called him and I will always remember this. I said, oh, I saw that you came out to see the kink in my hair. Um, what did you think of it? And he said, it was a very handsome production. <laughs> I remember that and I was like, handsome? Because I'd never heard my work described as handsome before. And he said, you know, it was handsome. And he said, but I didn't get it. And he said, I brought my girlfriend with me and he said, she was crying and she loved it and everything else. And he goes, but I just didn't get it. So I don't think it's for Mervish. So thank you for calling. And so I then did something really bold and I said to him, um, well, you're not supposed to get it. It wasn't meant for you. Like it wasn't written for you. And I said, if your girlfriend who liked the show was crying and was very touched by it, I said, who buys theater tickets? I said, are women. And I said, women not only buy theater tickets, but women also tend to really um, 
bring other women to shows. Like usually when we book stuff, we'll book for our friends, we'll book for our families. And I said, and this is what the show is about. And this is who the show is for. And so I said, would it be possible for me to come in and meet with you and Mr. Murf- um, David Murfish and give you a pitch? And he was like, okay, young lady. <laughs> and I then went back and I did my homework. I got a, a date to book. Um, and when I went in to meet with David Mervish, they said to me, I remember like right from the bat, they said, you know, we admire your tenacity and everything else, but we don't think this is a show for our, our audience. We tend to have an older white middle-class audience and um, they're just not going to get it. And then I turned around and this was something that they've always printed in the newspapers that I said, I said, well, your audience tends to be between the ages of 55 to 75, because I've done my research. And I said, so most of your audience is going to be dead in 20 years. So wouldn't you want to get a younger audience coming in? And I said, and that's what the kink brings. I said, our demographic are women between the ages of 18 to 35. And I said, any business wants to grow their audience. And I always remember David Beverage was like, oh, very interesting. <laughs> And that's how we got, no, they actually said, okay. And they didn't give us the deal right away. We had met with them and then there was a cancellation with another show, a bigger show. And they said, we'll program the kink for three weeks in the theater and kind of see how it goes. And the rest is history. Like we were there for five months, broke box office sales records and everything like that. Um, But it was not something, like I think people are always under the impression that Mervish came and gave me this deal. And I've always been like every single thing that has shown up in my life, I have asked for it and been really bold. And I think sometimes as women, we have to give ourselves permission to be bold. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, Did you can I can I just do a, one quick follow up? Sorry. Yeah. Like the shortest follow up. Um, was there a lot of change in uh, in the actual show from the Fringe production through to the Mervish production? Um, was there a lot of editing done, or did did the show remain mainly the same? There was quite a bit of changes in the sense of, because we finally had money, right? So it's amazing what money can do for a damn show, right? And rehearsal time, we're just like, what was that? We didn't even know what that was. Um, And so I added some more monologues. I tweaked some stuff. Um, We added more music. Um, Wayne Mangesha was very instrumental in um, just adding the music element of the play. Um, We also added a comedic monologue, which wasn't there because um, some of the feedback that we had gotten was that the play was very heavy and they wanted to add a a bit more of a comedic voice. And then also too, I had done the other monologue that um, it was an older woman's voice because my grandmother who used to come out to see the show every um, night when it was at Theatre Pass Mariah the Fringe Festival was like, you have every voice except for an older woman. And I would like to see an older woman there. And so I actually wrote a monologue and I called her Miss Enid and Enid was my grandmother's name. And so I dedicated that to my grandmother. And we also then added a bit more singing and stuff. And that's kind of how it evolved. And by the time it hit the US, uh, where it won four NAACP awards, it became like a full out musical. Like we had adapted it into a musical. So it just keeps changing all of the time. Yeah. Hey, Trey. Hi. (laughs) How are you doing? Good, thank you. Good. Good. Um, I'm an actor and a producer here in Toronto for film and theater. And uh, I'm also a martial artist. I'm a black belt in Taekwondo. Woo, okay, impressive. (laughs) Um, You spoke about this a little bit already, but I'm curious to know if you could um, speak on your experience of being a woman of color in this industry, um, what kind of challenges you've faced and uh, what kind of hardships you've faced and do you have any advice for other um, uh, female uh, people of color? Definitely. 
even after the great success of the kink in my hair, um, we had, you know, sold out box offices, broken box office records, the played grossed millions, we had turned into a TV show. When I wrote my second play, How Black Mothers Say I Love You, I was just under the assumption that I would go to any single theater and they'll be like, yes, of course, we want to produce this play. And I went and this is a real Canadian shit thing. And, and, the, and I'll just say it because this is how we function as Canadians, right? Um, and I do think if I was a white woman with the level of success that I had, and I'm not even going to beat around the bush, I think they would have been knocking at my door to say what you got on your plate next. And this is what I see with Americans is that Americans always want to be around hit makers, right? They want to make sure that they're kind of like, if you have one hit, we want to make sure we're around for the second hit. Canadians are kind of like, oh, well, it was a fluke, right? And you have to prove yourself over and over again. And so I went to every single theater in Toronto and they turned it down and said it was too niche because it was dealing with a West Indian mother, Jamaican mother, um, and de dealt with the uh, migration and immigration experience of Black women, um, Jamaican women in the Caribbean, especially, who leave their children behind and what happens once a family reunite and the main daughter, uh, the main protagonist was a lesbian. And it was a story based on what had happened within my own family of my mother being left behind by her mother and then my mother also leaving me. So I always say I come from um, women who leave their children, right? I come from a generation of women who leave their children. And everyone said, no, they said it was too niche. Then they said, um, your audience primarily is a black audience. They're not gonna wanna deal with a play that has homosexuality in it because, um, you know, black people are homophobic. Then they said, you know, it deals with this Caribbean family. Our white audiences aren't gonna get it. And, and so, so it was just, yeah. so basically everybody said no. And I then, because I truly believed in the play and I believed in myself and I said, okay. And I booked the theater. I wanted to do a three week run. I didn't have enough money. And so I booked the theater for exactly, I think it was a 12 day run. We did 12 days. And I found this young up and coming producer, Karis Lewis, who um, is this white woman from Wales, who was like, I'm gonna bet on this and um, I will come in and produce it. And I said, okay, we'll produce it ourselves. And then we ran out of money, so I couldn't hire a director. So I was like, okay, fuck, I'll, I'll direct it. Sorry, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear. I said, I'll direct it. And Karis was like, have you ever directed before? I was like, no, nope, but I think I could do it, <laughs> right? And that was just me. I was just like, okay, this play has to happen. And um, we brought all the actors in and I worked with um, a black set designer. Um, the actors were all involved and we sold out the entire run after we opened on the first night. And after we had done what we had done, then Factory Theater came and booked us for their next season because they saw how packed the shows were and what we were doing. Clement Virgo came out to see it one night and I called him myself personally, Clement Virgo. And I said to him, I would love for you to come and see this play again. I said, I think we have something here. And then he came and he was the one who actually, he bought the film and TV rights and um, that's how we adapted it. And now we just recently submitted that to Sundance. But again, I will say to people, if especially women of color, people will tell you no so many times. And I think what happens is that we get frozen in the no, right? We're kind of like, oh, well, they know and they know better and the industry and the industry wasn't created for us. And we need to stop trying to exist in it because they don't want us there, right? And so I've always been this person who's like, okay, you don't want me, I'll do it my damn self, right? But I feel like sometimes we're like, um, we're trying to get this acknowledgement from people who do not want to see you. And I'm just done with that. I'm just like, I know who my audience is, I know what my work is, and I will do it my damn self. And I think we need to have that level of audacity and that level of discipline and that level of, okay, maybe it's not gonna be done the way that I imagined, but I'm gonna start somewhere. And I think if there's anything that I've learned in my career is you need to start. It, will, it may not be perfect, but you have to start. Thank you.
for sharing. You're welcome. Thank you. That was so inspiring. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, I'm Misa, and um, I write an audio drama about a space stick that travels the cosmos in a shape-changing ship, solving mysteries for the editors of the Giant Book of Destiny. So that's inclusivity for all beings everywhere. <laughs> yes. But my question is, how do we highlight female artists with, with an atmosphere of inclusivity for everyone? So we want to highlight female artists, but we don't only want to talk to females. We want to talk to everybody. So how do we get everybody in when we're highlighting female artists? I think we have to look at the why and who we are highlighting. Um, I think a lot of times too, um, things tend to be, it's either very black and white, like if we're highlighting um, people of color, then the person is a black person, you know, and we um, don't look at First Nation indigenous women, we don't look at Asian women, we don't look at South Asian women. And I think the only way this is gonna shift is if people, especially white women, also have to really step aside and say, I've had my moment and I need to now pass that mic over to someone else and give them the spotlight. It cannot be tokenism. We all know what tokenism looks like. We all know when we've been in the room and we've been invited because they've just looked at their whole schedule and their whole season and like, oh shit, we don't have any people of color, right? And so it has to be something where you are actually dedicated um, to doing that. And I think um, a lot of times what happens is, you know, I've seen it even here in Atlanta where they did my play one year and I told them I wanted to do another play. And they said, oh, we, we already have a black show this year. Right. And I'm kind of like, you would never have said we've had four white shows this season. Right. And so until we start thinking about um, saying, we are really committed to creating diversity and diversity just doesn't stop at black people. We're not going to do our job properly. And I think it's also important for me as a black woman also to also be like sometimes to say, okay, what about other women of color? And I need to also open that gate for them and to also say they also need a chance and an opportunity. You know, like recently I was invited up by a theater company to work with, um, the First Nation community in Nunavut, and they wanted me to do um, a monologue series and working with the youth up there and do something very similar to the kink. And I was just like, that's not my place. There's enough First Nation indigenous women who can do exactly what I'm doing, right? And as much as I wanted the money, I knew that was not my place. And I said, I can consult if they feel that's what they want, but that's not my place. And that is, that is when we have to learn sometimes to step aside, just in the same way I would expect a white woman to do that for me and say, you know what, I've had my moment. And that's how I look at it. You can consult, you can support, but you do not have to be the voice of a community that you do not belong to, especially when there's qualified people from that community who can do the exact same work and are not given that opportunity. So that's how I see it. When we talk about inclusivity, we need to really stop talking about a drop here and a drop there. You really have to take it on as your entire mandate. Right, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Are we back to the top? I guess I'm next. Oh. <laughs> ah, as you know, my name is Georgia Fullerton. I am a visual artist and an expressive arts therapist. I also just started a private membership group and it is called Create My Art Story. Hmm. And I, I help uh, professional women create a life by their own design so that they can Perfect. clarify their own self-expression and connect to the people, places, and things that bring them healthy relationships and potentially abundance. Um, oh, I love it. <laughs> thank you, been working on that. Uh, <laughs> but I have to say, just as a really quick tidbit, I was able to get two of my paintings on the kink in my hair um, way back in the day. Oh, I was on yes. set and I watched that whole deal. And of course I exhibited at um, Harbourfront for the live play as well. 
But yes. Trey, I want to ask you, um, what would you say, you may have answered this already, but what would you say is the accomplishments that you're most proud of um, in your business and personal life? Mm. I think for me, my biggest accomplishment, and I try my best to do this, is to treat everyone with the same level of respect, no matter what their position is. I don't know if it's because I come from a working class family where my grandmother used to sweep the trains and where my single mom used to work three jobs to provide for us and I grew up in Toronto housing and I know what it feels like to be viewed as less than but I really try to walk through the world in the sense of trying to make everyone feel valid and seen and heard and of course not every time you accomplish that but I really try my best to do that and I try and create that in the atmosphere that I work and the people who work with me to know that that's how we treat everyone. There's no like, oh, tr Trey's the executive producer, so everyone's really cool and wonderful to Trey. And then the person who's coming in, who's cleaning the office after the rehearsals, are we, we don't acknowledge them or talk to them. I just don't run stuff like that. And everybody is an integral part of the work that we do. And so I feel for me, that is, the biggest thing that I feel I'm proud of that no matter what success may come, I don't feel success has changed me. I don't feel money has changed me. I think I'm still that same gal, the same person. And um, yeah, like you, it doesn't, you don't have to treat people badly to feel good about yourself. And I think sometimes I've seen that in this industry where people just shit on other people just because you have the power to do so. And I don't believe in that. Um, so I feel that to me is my biggest accomplishment. Like I will talk to people or bump into people who I met in high school and they were like, oh my God, I didn't think you would remember me or I didn't even think you would say hi and blah, blah, blah. And they're like, oh, you're still the same trend. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> Can I be? got a little bit more money. Yeah, and that's cool, but I'm still me, you know what I mean? And I've always been that. Like I still broke into Patois no matter what I'm doing, if I'm doing a corporate talk or if I'm talking to, um, the kids in Rexdale, it's always the same consistent me. And I think I have a true sense of who I am. And I think it's because of my grandmother and mother just instilled that in me, that you have to have a true sense of who you are at all times. Yeah, absolutely. Very resonant, very resonant answer. Thank you. Thank you, Trey. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, Trey. Hey. Um, so, it's a great conversation. It's uh, very dynamic, going in a lot of different directions. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask, is there anything that you specifically want to talk about? Things that are on your mind lately um, that you want to say that you think are important topics that we should be talking about? Maybe we're not, or maybe we're not talking about them enough. What's on your mind these I think, especially coming from the theater industry, um, most of my accomplishments being from that and, and TV, I think one of the things that to me is really extremely important is who gets the power to program a show? Who gets the power to green light a show? Who gets the power to validate someone's experience and say, this is who needs um, to have a voice? And I think until we start to really address the institutional, um, the institutional racism and the systemic racism that um, is happening in theater, TV, publishing and white people are able to say, hey, you know what? This needs to change. It's not up to people of color to change. I've had so many times when people are like, oh, we want you to come and sit on a diversity panel. I want you to come. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I've said my piece. I, I, don't, I don't need to talk about diversity. I know what diverse looks like. You need to get your white people to talk about diversity. I ain't coming nowhere. I, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm done out of talking. Show me some action. And when you're doing some action, and you want to engage with me, I'm there. But I'm not sitting on any more diversity panels. And I think every person of color and indigenous person will say the same damn thing. We've talked enough. <laughs> we know what it looks like. And we ain't got nothing else to say. There's nothing new to say. 
So for me, I feel that's an important point of what we need, um, need to be talking about. And how are we changing those institutions? And how are we saying change needs to happen? Um, for example, right now in the city of Toronto, I think they have about three or four major big theaters that are owned by the cities that is empty, right? That nothing is being programmed in there. Why couldn't a black theater company take over that? Why couldn't they give it to um, other communities of color and say, program your own shows and here's another artistic director. We have empty theaters sitting in Toronto and no one thinks to seem to think that's a problem, right? <laughs> to me, that's just craziness. And then we want to put up a Black Lives Matter square and think we've done our shit. I I'm, I'm good, right? Um, I was saying I'm in a part of this group um, for um, writers of color and they had the audacity, the Writers Guild of Canada, to write and talk about the kink in my hair being one of their diverse shows and blah, 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 blah. The kink in my hair has been off the air now, what, about six or seven years, and that's what you want to point to? And I said, I had to leave Canada as a writer because I could not get into a writing room in Canada, me. And I said, so if I can't get into a writing room in Canada, what else is happening? And I said, other American, and, and I've been in like three different now American writing rooms and I can't get a job in my own damn country. That's a problem, right? And I remember approaching the Writers Guild of Canada and saying um, at one point when America was doing it about show us your writing room to show how diverse it is. And I said, we need to do the exact same thing in Canada because I know there's not diversity in our writing rooms. And they were like, oh, yeah, 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 we're going to follow up on that. We're going to get back to you. Nothing. And then they have the nerve to post Black Lives Matter score. Please stop. Stop. And that is where I'm talking about when people um, have lip service instead of actual action. And, and I think because I'm the person to call people on their bullshit, people get really scared when I, I talk because I'm just like, I'm, I'm done. Like, you, you guys, are, it's all talk. And we need to do better. Thank you. I appreciate your candidness and your. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going to start back at the top for our second round. Hey! Uh, hey, we made it to round two with Chantel. Yeah. Um, so I had a question. I know you write a ton of different things. So you're. You have a novel coming out, you've done television, you've done theater, you've done stand up. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just, I was wondering uh, how much your process differs between the different mediums. And then um, also, how do you decide when you come up with an idea that you feel is like this is a burning story? How do you decide <laughs> which medium it's going to fit best? And I know you've transitioned oh. both from theater to film or and theater to television. So it's transferred. Uh -huh. How do you how do you decide where it fits best? I really listen to my instincts. I get very quiet. Um, I meditate a lot. Um, I'm very spiritual. Um, even though I cuss like a pirate, I consider myself <laughs> very spiritual. And I feel I have a really good connection with the universe and divine intervention in my life. And so I usually get the messaging of how it's going to happen by just prayer. And I wait and I sit and I'm in silence. And then I go, okay, this is how we're going to do it. And I get a lot of inspiration from a lot of times um, as woo woo as the sound, sometimes I'm sitting at the computer and I just hear this kind of voice goes, this is what we're doing. And it just, the work kind of writes itself. Um, also for me, it's about just being really aware of um, you're not in this by yourself. That I, I truly believe everybody has a divine purpose. And for me, I truly believe I was put here on this earth to tell stories and to create stories and to create community and give voice to the voiceless. And so I sit in that at all times asking for direction and saying, how do you want to use me? That's the thing that I say all of the time. I'm always like, God, how do you want to use me today? And this is what we're doing. So that's kind of how I, I work. It's just like, it's never, I never sit down and go, oh, I'm going to write a film today or, oh, I'm going to write a new play. It just is kind of like, how do you want to use me today? 
And then I go around my family too, as my mother says, don't say anything in front of her. It will end up on stage or in a book. And my family are the most dysfunctional, funny family I've ever met. And so anytime I want a little inspiration, I go home to my family and for sure there's a damn story there. Yeah, that needs to be told. Awesome, thank you. And I also loved all of the stories that came out in How Black Mothers Say I Love You. Hilarious. Um, thank so you. Awesome. Yeah, that's my mother and grandmother to a T. Like <laughs> them, like some of the actual um, sentences and quotes were direct quotes from my grandmother and mother. So they were watching it going, oh my goodness. Like my mother was like, I hope you pay me some royalties. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Trace. I see my baby. My baby's up there. <laughs> I'm now a mom. <laughs> hey, Tay. T. T. Hi, T. Yes, correct them when they mess up your damn name, girl. <laughs> I'm with you. Let them pronounce it properly. You're damn right. Yes, T. Um, so I, I, I trained as an actor. I went to acting school for film and television and, uh, I, you know, moved to Toronto to pursue it. And I wasn't, um, uh, you know, as an emerging artist, it's hard to get in the room. And then when I'm in the room, it's other white people. Uh And, you know, I, uh, so I started picking up, uh, producing to create work for myself. Uh, I find a lot of actors are doing now. So yeah. I wanted to know if you had advice for um, actors who are picking up producing and producing their own work after having so much success. Oh. Yeah. I definitely will say produce your own stuff. It's not enough to be like, oh, I'm an actor. Cause I, I did the exact same thing. I went to um, drama school and I came back and I thought I would get all these wonderful roles and that just didn't happen. Um, I think also people get chosen when you are working and you are out there. You never know who is going to be coming into the room to see you, who's watching. I can't tell you how many times I've gone in for something. Just recently, I went in to pitch at a production company and the person said, oh yeah, I I follow you on Instagram. And I love that you're always doing this and you're doing that. I love the stuff that you do. And I was like, really? I had no idea this woman was following me on Instagram. And so you just don't know who is following. And I think especially in this world right now where we have access to social media, where we have access to YouTube, where we have access to be able to produce our own shit. Why are we not doing that? And we could put up our stuff and we can cut out the middleman. And I think a lot of times too, where people get discouraged is that you think everything is going to happen overnight. Um, I will say the biggest secret to my success is consistency. Um, my first show, I remember I put on in the library and people always talk about, oh, the success of the kink in my hair and the fringe. I was doing shows at Second City, North York Library, the Now Lounge before I got the fringe, fringe Festival and I was growing my audience. And I started with an audience of 10 and then I treated that audience really well. And I would always say to them after the show, if 10 people came, I said, if you love the show next month, can you bring a friend? And they would bring a friend. And that's how it just started to grow. And I think a lot of times we are under the impression, unless we're doing three or 400 seat housing um, shows, we're not doing well. And you're not going to get there until you start at five people. And you're not going to get there until you start at 20. And everything that I've learned along the way has made me be a better producer. And it goes back to that same principle I said again of treating people in a way that every single person who came to my show, we can't do this now in the COVID era, but (laughs) I used to always shake people's hand and say, thank you for coming to my show. And I would look them in the eye and I'd be like, if you love the show, I'm producing it myself, please guys, can you help? Um, I know now this is the end thing and nobody will ever give me credit for this, but I will say this was damn me. I remember years ago going to theater and The producer, nobody came out to say hello to the audience. They would go right away um, into the show. And I remember I said, no, I wanna always come out before every show and thank the audience for coming. I wanna have a little interaction with the audience. And they were like, oh, that's so unprofessional. That's my theater. 
we 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 have to um, just go right into it and nobody interacts with the audience. And I was like, no, I'm going to do that. And that's how I grew my audience. And now I go to every single theater show now and everybody now, the artistic directors are all coming out and talking to the audience because they realize they never made that connection with the audience and they're losing their audience. Right. But it just makes me laugh when I think about how they used to say that what I was doing was unprofessional. But yet my audience was growing and your audience was dying. Right. And now they're doing the exact same thing. But nobody will give me credit for that. So I'm always like, OK, guys, we're good. Right. And that's what I think as a producer, you need to know what's your stamp, how you are going to interact with your audience, what you want people to experience from your shows. It's not a, just about having packed shows. It's about what do you want your audience to walk away from after they've experienced a show by T, right? What will stay with them? And that's something that every single time we're producing a show, I always say to my producers, I said, what's the experience we're going to give them? Because it has to be consistent that everybody will walk away from a Trey Anthony show going, that was the best shit I've ever seen. And, and it's the experience. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I You're welcome. Producers appreciate it too. Thank um, you. Oh, so I'm going to jump back in. Uh, yeah, our, I love this. Hey, our time is just flying by because we're wow. in the room <laughs> with the words of wisdom and the passion, the feelings. It, it just yeah. like, it flies by. I really appreciate um, you taking the time tray to uh, share this space with us and get us uh, going virtually with this program. And uh, we do have a few moments left. And is there, would you like to talk about the many, many exciting things that are on your plate coming up in your near future? I know there's quite a few exciting developments you might just want to mention. Yeah, I recently got two development deals with CBC. Um, that same uh, producer who I told you, that white girl, Karis Lewis, who became my right-hand business partner and writing partner, we're doing a show called White Girl Magic, um, which is about uh, the relationship between a Black woman and a white woman. And the Black woman has adopted the white woman's biracial son. And it brings them together um, to raise this child. And it's a dramedy that looks at race, class, um, racism, and everything all under the sun. So I'm really excited about that. And it really was based on the friendship that Karis and I have had over the years of working together, of her being like this nearly six foot white Welsh woman and me being less than five feet Black woman <laughs> and how we walk through the world and how the world sees us and our friendship. Um, so that I'm really excited about. The other sh um, show I got is called... Um, Bad Mom Diaries, where it's kind of, I'm getting my Oprah on, where I'm going to be interviewing parents, caregivers, dads, you name it, all about parenting and the things that you've learned and mistakes that you made and learning lessons and things that you would have done differently. Um, so that I'm excited about. And then I have my book coming out, Black Girl in Love with Herself, which is with Hay House and... Um, Penguin House um, as well and Random House, that's coming out January, 2021. And so I would tell people you can jump online and order, pre-order, that's really important. Just keep spreading the word. I'm really excited about that initiative and stuff happening with that. So those are my major big projects. Um, you can follow me at Black Girl in Love. Um, my website, treyanthony.com, I'm gonna be doing a whole revamp and releasing the new website um, in about two weeks. And so I'm really excited about that. We're doing a lot of online programming and a lot of stuff online. So look out for that as well. Yeah. Great. That all sounds super, super exciting. Thank, thank you. you. So, yeah. I want to thank you again, Trey, for being our special slammer uh, this time around. Thank you. thank you for having me and thank you for all of the wonderful questions. Yeah, and thanks to our panelists with their wonderful um, questions and energy. Uh, thanks to any of our viewers out there. And we hope to also be doing more of these industry slam sessions uh, on a regular yet random basis. So if anyone wants to participate, uh, be involved as a panelist or a slammer, let us know. You can always reach out to shadowpaththeater.ca and those are my final words. 
please everybody be safe, be well, and make art from your heart. And until next time, stay shadowpathic. <laughs> Bye. Bye guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye.